Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done about 410 of them now, and if you haven't seen any before and would like to see others, <coughs> go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and you'll find all the previous ones organized in various ways. Um, this show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, and so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there is a donate button on every page of the website, and we appreciate those who have been supporting it, and those who haven't. <laughs> it's good to be able to provide it to people. <laughs> so um, my guest today is Sri M, and uh, Sri M is a spiritual guide, social reformer, and educationist. I interviewed him last October, and really enjoyed the conversation, as did thousands of viewers. Um, and he has just written a new book, which I just finished reading and enjoyed very much, and uh, we decided to do a second interview. So, welcome, Shriam. Thank you for coming Thank back. Thank you, William. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. coming back. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll read a, an abbreviated version of his bio, his bio. You can read the full thing on, on the website, you know, batgap.com and probably many of you are already familiar with him, but here's a, here's a synopsis. Um, at the age of nine, Sri M's spiritual transformation was initiated by his future master, Maheshwarnath Babaji, who miraculously appeared under a jackfruit tree in the compound of his home. This meeting set the stage for their future reunion in the Himalayas when Sri M was 19. For three and a half years, he lived and traveled extensively through the Himalayas with his master, who guided him through his initiation, his kundalini awakening, and the eventual meeting with Sri Mahavatar Babaji, who is the one discussed in Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. A few years after his master passed, passed away, he received the spiritual go-ahead to commence his mission. Um, I just wanted to ask you on that one point, I don't remember reading this in your book, but did your master, who had passed over, come to you in some kind of subtle form and say, start teaching? Or what was the nature of that go-ahead that he, you got? No, uh, he didn't do anything of that kind. But I did have, I rarely have uh, vivid dreams, especially of the master. You rarely do? Dream. I rarely do. Okay. So I had this dream in which... Um, Oh, I must go back a little a minute. Uh -huh. um, you know, I had a friend in uh, in Bangalore who was uh, part of the Theosophical Society. So he came to know that I used to wear jeans and T-shirts, so it's difficult to figure out. So uh, this guy came to know through an old friend of mine that had gone to the Himalayas. So he came to me and said, can you talk at the Theosophical Society in Bangalore? That was the first. I said, give me two weeks, I need to think about it, because I still thought I haven't got the green signal to mm -hmm. talk or to be in public. Mm -hmm. So I came back to Madhnapalli, where I live, which is about three hours from Bangalore, Andhra Pradesh. And then that night, while I was seriously thinking what to do, I had this very vivid dream. It was a little bit funny dream, because I was on a railway station, and there was a train standing there with a big banner saying satsang in english in english and i got into the into this train and i'm sitting there waiting and then the guard comes out from the gate uh, holding a green light in his hand you know even now in india mm -hmm. we have the guy waving green lights right. i don't know now like a signal yeah. man or something yeah yeah when it is it means don't go mm -hmm. it's green it means move it's like the green signal mm -hmm. so i saw this guard and i bust out laughing because he was babaji wearing a white uniform of a railway guard <laughs> and, he, and he had no footwear and his hair was still matted, and top of that there was this pea cap, you know. I burst out laughing, and the train started off. <laughs> uh, so I woke up in the morning, and when I when this man called me, I said, Mohan, I think I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> That's how it started. <laughs> uh, 
and then I went to the Theosophical Society on a Sunday. I was expecting 20, 25 people. There were about 100 people sitting there. Mm. And this was my first exposure and I didn't know what to do. So I again closed my eyes and said, this is what Babaji wants. Okay. And I, I started talking to the man sitting in front of me. Just like I'm talking to you mm -hmm. in a very personal manner. I forgot the rest. And then at the end of it, they said, oh, that was a very good talk. So can we repeat it? This is how the circus, I'm sorry, the, the whole thing started. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's great. That's actually a technique that people who train others in public speaking advocate. They say, talk to just one person, you know, mm. and then another mm. person perhaps. But don't just put out of your mind that you might be talking yeah. to several hundred yeah. people. Yeah. And that makes it very personal and the audience appreciates that. It, it happened to me uh, automatically. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not a guy who reads how to talk. How to <laughs> yeah, he just picked up on it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So one final bit of your bio that I didn't read yet. Um, that your message seeks to transcend the outer shell of all religions by exploring their mystical core to nurture the innate goodness in every human being. So I just wanted to add that. Um, you know how we heard that the Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi tree and there are other stories of saints and sages who had some kind of profound sudden illumination at a certain point and that was their enlightenment. Um, do you feel that that is the way it tends to be for everyone? In, in other words, is there some, there's a word in English like a watershed moment which is like a clear demarcation between this side and this side the way uh, the top of a mountain peak would be. Do you feel that there's a, um, a sort of a, a profound, significant, clearly perceivable watershed moment of enlightenment for everybody on, on the spiritual path? Or like there was for the Buddha? And was there for you, for instance? Or do you feel like for most people it's a sort of gradual, incremental, subtle thing that you might not notice so dramatically? Mm -hmm. Well, for this, I would like to say that I did have an in kind of a explosive uh, experience once, mm -hmm. but it's it subsided, mm. and then it was as if it was firing up uh, in, a, in in different contexts, in different ways, in small measure, not this huge thing. Mm -hmm. But the turning point, you could say, was this kind of energy surging inside me, which I had in Badrinath. Mm. And I was with, uh, with my Ishwanath Bharati, mm -hmm. if you read the autobiography. So that day, there was a definitely a remarkable change in my system. Um, but then I, I sometimes suspect Babaji wanted to keep it down and not allow me to go into it fully, mm. because there was some work to be done. Because I felt that this is meaningless. Now there's nothing to do. Sit in the Himalayas. Mm. That changed after a while. And then, so I did get it back, but it took a lot of what you just mentioned. You didn't use the word, but little firings here and there, you know, like mm -hmm. tuck, tuck, tuck. It's not like one thing. Yeah. After that. Okay, good. Then, Okay, continue. Yeah. yeah, continue. And then, and then one day, several years later, I got that thing back. But then it was not an explosion like, it was like a wave. It was like flowing. Mm. So these are two central points which have an interval of maybe mm, 10 years from each other. Mm -hmm. 10 years. So uh, well, that's it. That's how it happened. But between, in this interval of 10 years, there was a process of growing. Uh, like, uh, how do I put it? It's like somebody started an experiment. It was successful. And then they continue to do it till it reached the culmination. It's similar, something like that. So the thing after 10 years, um, that second made significant mm -hmm. Suddenly, mm -hmm. did you feel like th there was some finality to that? Like now, now you've really arrived, um, or has there still been growing even after yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, you're right. Uh, I felt that now I have the capacity to take off. 
-hmm. and I could book into any of those flights. Mm -hmm. uh, but since then I have been flying here, and I'm not talking about my astral body, but I've been flying here and there, and it's it's growing. I don't personally think that there is an end to it right now. Mm -hmm. It's still going on. Yeah, that is a, a topic that I often bring up and or that often comes up in these interviews, you know, because most people say what you just said, that they don't feel like any end to it. A few people whom I've interviewed say they feel like they have reached an end and, and I say, well, nothing more, you know, 10 years from now, don't you think there'll be some greater maturation or unfoldment or something? And they, they can't relate to that notion. Um, uh -huh. And, and this relates to something that there's a kind of an age-old debate in spiritual circles, circles between the so-called direct path and the progressive path. Have you heard of that mm -hmm. debate? Mm. I think all are direct paths, but in some individuals, it might have to be watered down and made progressive. Let's put it this way. Okay. And... Um, on a similar note, you know, some of the great masters like your master Maheshwar Babaji and, and Mahavatar Babaji himself and other perhaps great ascended beings, ascended masters, Jesus or whoever, um, do you feel that even for them there is somehow continued evolution or does one eventually reach a point at which there's no possibility of any further development? As far as Mahavatar Babaji, we call him Sri Guru Babaji. Mm -hmm. Some people call him Mahamuni Babaji, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, as far as that being is concerned, I cannot make any comment because I don't know right. how it is, right? As far as Maheshwanath Babaji is concerned, I felt personally, he didn't say anything, but I felt that he had reached the height of spiritual evolution possible with this human body. Ah. Mm. Which means maybe there's something else. As far as the human body is concerned, I think he had done it because he said he doesn't have to come back. Right. If there's still something left, you come back and work it out. Yeah. Well, in the Vedic literature, obviously, there are references to all sorts of beings who are not in human bodies, and somehow they, they got to that stage, you know, so perhaps that perhaps that's where we go once the human body has True. you know reached True. its... I guess so, I guess so, mm. uh, and I might have some hints, but <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> One time I was sitting with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and he, he sort of paused, paused and sat back and he, he had been talking about immortality and he said, you know, if we want immortality, there must be much better bodies than these in which to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I mean, on the lighter side, somebody told me the other day, Sadhu, in, right, that all good souls are not coming back to India. Now they're going born in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I said, but why? He said, well, I went there twice. Somebody took me there, and they are more kind of uh, more sensitive to these things which we are saying. He can't talk a word in English. He can only talk Hindi. But he said somebody was translating for me. Mm -hmm. So you never know where people are and in what kind of system or body they are. There might be spiritually evolved beings everywhere. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and everywhere should go far beyond the earth. I mean, the yeah. recent discoveries by the uh, Kepler telescope indicate that there are planets around most stars and it's estimated that there may be more earth-like planets in the universe than there are grains of sand in all the beaches of the world so you know imagine how many <laughs> forms of life there are and how many possibilities there are right and also it, if there is a planet or a, a heavenly body which doesn't have the same conditions as the earth we can't say that there is no life there because the life there may be surviving under different conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is a kind of a, a barrier we have. We think that this earth is the only place where there can be life and human beings can evolve. I think it's really very childish to think so. There may be much, there are much more evolved beings on other planes. Mm. They may not be like earth, they may be different. Yeah, and when, and, oh, go ahead, continue. And if they are like Earth, it's possible that there are some Earth-like beings there who have evolved. We can't say this. This is called narrowing down. I call this what we call a 
a scientific prejudice. Mm. There, are, there are unscientific and there are scientific prejudices. So people say, no, it's not fashionable. It's not science to think that there are. But then every day there are new discoveries. Oh. Yeah, there, there were some notes from your book uh, later on. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, here it is. Um, your guru said to you, um, one who denies a statement without inquiry builds a mental obstruction that blocks all knowledge. How can one seek something which one has denied offhand? Um, yeah. So it seems to me that anything that we can imagine or that any religion has ever said or anything else can be taken as a working hypothesis that could be investigated. Absolutely. I believe that. What you said just now, what you read just now, mm -hmm. is probably been planted so deep in my consciousness. My whole thought process has been this. That you can't say no unless you investigate. Mm -hmm. And investigation is not only the process of putting something in a test tube and keeping it in the laboratory, there are many other ways of investigation. Yeah. You know, so. I think we might have talked uh, about this in the last interview, but I think that you would agree that the most sophisticated scientific instrument for investigation is the human nervous system, you know? It's uh, how, what an intricate, marvelous instrument it is if we know how to use it properly. True. True. I was reading a beautiful book last time I came here um, called uh, Buddha's Brain. Mm. That was quite a nicely researched book on uh, uh, the neurology and neurosis. It's by a neurologist. I forget the name. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And I think every human being is uh, kind of equipped with Buddha's brain in some way, but it's not been activated. Right. It's... Uh, latent. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah. Um, quite a few questions have already come in, largely from Indians, um, <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be more during the interview. There's about 240 people watching right now on the live feed, um, but I'll, I'll ask some of these, and I have like four pages of notes of other things I want to ask as we go along. Okay. So okay. I'll take a few of these. Um, this is from a fellow named uh, KP in Mumbai. He asks, uh, he has like several questions that I condense down a little bit. First part is, does everyone need a guru? How do we recognize our guru? All right. Um, yes, I think every human being who wants to step into the spiritual path journey needs a guide. But the need may not be evident probably when you start off with that's why there are lots of people who are interested but don't, don't have a teacher. But it may not be evident, the need may not be evident. But after a while, you begin to understand that you're on unexplored territory, basically. So if someone has passed through, it would be a good idea to have a guide. Please don't bring, we, sh we shouldn't bring in people like Ramana Maharshi, who did not have a teacher. No, everybody is not Ramana Maharshi. He was One. exceptional, yeah. Exceptional. And I don't believe he didn't have a guru. I personally think he must have had at some point mm -hmm. in his life. I'm a person who feels that there are many lives. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. So, so I personally think that yes, we need a teacher. We need a guru. But I'm not saying that the guru should become more important than what he's teaching. These are two things. Right. It's not an idol worship kind of, oh, this is, but it's like a guide because we are largely walking on unexplored uh, landscapes. We might fall into pits and then may not be able to come out. So yeah. this, I think so. What do you think about that saying that when the disciple is ready, the, the master will appear? This is one thing I like to have this interview with you because you you have a graphic understanding of this thing. You know, when you <laughs> ask, it's not a it's not just a question. It's it, it's it has many things behind it. You're right. Uh, the guru comes, but then it's only when one is really searching, mm -hmm. not searching for a fashion. Because my friends have a guru, so I have a guru. It's not that nowadays in parties when people meet. Once upon a time it was, oh, I have a heart problem, what about you? Now it's like, I have a guru, what about you? Do you right. have a guru? I mean, it's growing. So not that, yeah, <laughs> not that way. 
but when one is so serious one has tried one's best and is kind of beating one's head against the wall and then it's i wish there was somebody to guide me in this and i'm very serious then i'm 100% sure that somebody appears mm-hmm. uh and he, the person who appears may not also turn out to be finally your guru this is also possible the person might have come to help you along until you find somebody yeah so could you say that um there could be transitional gurus that you know like yes. just like in education we go through various grades and uh, each grade yes. is important you know you can't uh, skip it necessarily unless you're really smart uh, uh, but uh, they all have their value i believe that but so there is an expression in uh, the literature the the sanskrit literature regarding sadhana and spiritual practice mm-hmm. on the what you call the marga the path mm-hmm. which is that there are gurus and there are upagurus When you say upa guru, it means somebody who supports you. Right. It need not necessarily mean the guru. In any case, ultimately, the supreme being is the guru. Right. You know the sloka. Ultimately. Paramasukadam kevalam jnana murti. So that is the guru. But it manifests in different people when one needs help. Good. So, Yeah, and I think that one underlying point here is that the universe isn't dumb. There there's some kind of divine orchestration, some kind of divine guidance and um you know, we're it's just it's not a cold mechanistic meaningless universe and it's intelligent. And and when the time comes, the as you said earlier, when the the need is really acute and sincere, then it will be it will be fulfilled it unfolds yeah let's put it that way it unfolds okay um speaking of gurus then um there was a story in your book where you were in a particular ashram and i forget the name of the master you'll remember this in a minute and you were chanting a particular mantra that was um the main sort of spiritual practice for that ashram it had ram's name in it and um then you you desired to, to take initiation in this mantra formally and so you went to the master in that ashram <clears throat> and he agreed to initiate you and he brought out a tape recorder of his master chanting that mantra and that was your initiation So you went and you, you you now after that initiation you were chanting the same mantra that you had been chanting but there was some kind of formal initiation that took place that was very sure. significant to you and your experience sure. was really profound after that. So what is the significance of initiation? Uh this is actually one of KP's questions and can a person be initiated without even knowing it? Um may be possible but in my life i have no such experience i was initiated with full knowledge of mm-hmm. this like uh, the instance that you have talked about was a, a great teacher called papa ramdas who used to live in uh, anand ashram in kerala mm-hmm. on the north, northern side of kerala so his disciple swami sachidanand so i have, i haven't met this papa ramdas so because he passed away so i went to some church I mentioned this because of his humility because he always said that he is the guru not me and so when I asked him can I get the mantra I know the mantra of course it is om shri ram jay ram jay jay ram so I said uh, he said well papa will initiate you so he had taped him his guru chanting the mantra I said he played it to me and he said now that's your initiation mm. believe me it had a profound effect on me uh it may not have been possible if even a human being had said it this was a tape recorder mm. the old tape recorder you know so which means that when a person has touched the meaning of the mantra and experienced it himself or herself as it matter then when it is passed on to another through any media could be tv it could it has a certain effect the best thing of course would be to personally be with the person and mm. take it failing that there are alternatives but the person who gives the mantra 
should have got the Siddhi of the mantra, which means he should have used it and reached the ultimate aim of chanting of the mantra. So then when it comes from that source, immediately there is a change in the consciousness and also in the energy levels inside. That's what I meant. Okay. So in other words, the ma if, the, if it's imparted properly by someone who's qualified to impart it, then it's imbued with some sort of shakti or potency that it wouldn't have if you just read it in a book or something like that. Yes, right. I, I, I believe this. Right. Okay. Um, now in your second book in particular, the, the, you tell a lot of stories that are related to past lives, your own past lives. Yes. And um, some of them are extremely detailed. And okay. I'm wondering, how did you come <laughs> upon <laughs> such detailed r recollections of all these past lives? Was it intentional? Was it spontaneous? Mm. Did you do some technique to remember them or what? Um, it's like this. Uh, many years ago when I was with Maheshwanath Babaji, he had taught me a way of retracting back to your past. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I was told not to do it immediately, except in one case. So it was with me, and I hadn't tried it, and it was almost rusted, the way of doing it. Almost what? Rusted. Rusted, like a rusty yeah. wheel or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I... Because uh, you were decided, out of practice, you hadn't done it for so long. No. Right. I was not... I was not uh, really interested, oh, it doesn't matter what you were and so on. Then one day, it I, the thought occurred to me that people might benefit if you really figure out this, because usually they are considered cock and bull stories. So, right. I, so I went into this, I started, it was about 10 years ago, I started practicing how to go back. And believe me, one doesn't have only six or seven lives, one has hundreds of lives. But I have put down on paper only those which I have a clear recollection and which I have to work hard on this recollection. Yeah. Case to case, each case separately. It's not as if one day everything is known. So this is what has happened and I have put it down and I have not put down anything of which I have no detailed recollection. You can't maintain a diary of your past life, so, you know. So only where I felt satisfied and said, okay, this is right. And also, I have in some cases personally gone and checked up the localities which are mentioned to see if they match with what I'm thinking and what's in my mind, what's getting into my mind. And the actual process takes about three, four days of complete darkness, rest, where you're not going out and where you're at least for six to eight hours in a kind of trance-like state mm. where the memories come down. But immediately after that, in about an hour or two, you should note it down somewhere, either on a tape recorder or write it down because they tend to disappear in about two hours roughly mm. from your head. Yeah. So after having written that, Suddenly, if somebody asks me a detail, I don't know because it's it's come and it's been written and it's washed out. I've had uh, conversations bordering on debates with some people in these interviews who don't believe in reincarnation. These are spiritual people, you know. Um, seems to like a lot of them tend to be Buddhists sometimes. Um, and personally, the reason I feel like it's worth discussing and hashing out is that I think if we're spiritual seekers it behooves us to want to to understand how the universe works and I mean we don't get to choose if there is reincarnation we don't get to choose whether there is or not um, it would be a universal principle and and if we really want to be knowers of reality then we ought to sort it out in our understanding because it changes your whole perspective on um, on you know the significance of this life and morality and all kinds of issues. I, I think uh, we should keep clear of this tendency to not believe in it before we look into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, if you say Buddhist, the Buddha himself has record, has is said to have remembered a hundred lives. Right. 
Yeah, I don't know why Buddhists tend to say this when that was the case in Buddhism, but... <laughs> yes, you see the Jataka tales and various other stories, mm -hmm. they are about the past lives of the Buddha. Yeah. So. One thing that this fellow KP found puzzling um, is that, you know, not, not all of your lives were very good, uh, and, and not necessarily in the same, in the progressive order. For instance, in very early lives you recounted having actually met Krishna way, way back, and then later the Buddha, and yet in subsequent lives you were a prostitute, uh, in a couple of them. So I guess the question is, did you backslide, or why would you go from, you know, meeting with Krishna and the Buddha to being a prostitute? I think there were some beings who were kind of uh, charting out my course. Uh -huh. It's not just me. So, if you had to come, for instance, and work with people who are like, I don't like the word prostitute, you know, it's kind Co of... Courtesan or... Whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's that there are some people who are like that. You can't put them on any low level. Right. So, if you had to work with even there, then you need to see what they go through. So I personally feel that I was put through this, not put in a, in a kind of pushed into it, but I told, now you do this so that you can figure out what it's like. Mm. You understand? So, yeah, that's a very good point. I'm going to be interviewing someone next mo month who um, was basically a drug addict, really badly involved in drugs, and then had this kind of when she hit rock bottom, had this profound awakening, mm -hmm. and is now able to relate to people who are going through things like that, and in a way oh, that she probably wouldn't mm -hmm. have, you know, if, right. if she hadn't gone through it herself. Gone. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that was part of the story, in my case. Okay. Um, Okay, well, just quickly, while we're on this subject of past lives, is a question from Justin in Bangalore, wondering if you remember any past lives as a Christian. The thing is, I haven't put down all the hints that I have about many lives. For right. people who wonder, why only in India? Why not? How can a soul be only coming back again and again in India? It's mm -hmm. not. So, the thing is, as I said, I have only put down what I can clearly remember, which doesn't mean that there are no other lives. Right. And I am kind of 50% sure that if I look carefully, I'm yeah. going to, I'm not going to stop there. I might find a, a beautiful Christian life. I have some hints where I was a hermit somewhere in the desert. Mm. In the early Christians, not the organized church, the early Christian, even probably before the Bible was set up or... Maybe one the of the Gnostic, Vatican, Gnostic yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Even, I think even before the, the it was organized into a Gnostic thing, mm. I mean, like... So, I have hints, but I can't uh, uh, write it down until I'm perfectly sure what I do. So, I'm, I'm working on it, okay. you know. Lovely. And you may find many other wild stories in future. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of material for future books. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a question from uh, what is it? Gita in London. She wonders if you had ever met Nisargadatta Maharaj of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, I met Nisargadatta Maharaj. I can't remember the year. It was about two years before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Mm. And a very interesting meeting because I went to see, by the time, I don't think he was running that shop, you know, he was staying in a small uh, room in the back streets of Pune. So I went to meet him and I was talking to him. He was still smoking. Right. Yeah, that's a great thing. And uh, he was very kind. And he said, so what's your plan? We okay. First he spoke in Marathi, I said, speak in Hindi, I don't know, ah, okay, he said. And uh, we had a very nice, he said, ordered for a cup of tea, had a cup of tea. I was surprised because I thought there'll be a huge crowd. Mm. There was nobody at that time. I mean, there were a few people. Then I said that somebody has written a book, uh, which, is, which says it's your teachings. And uh, the title of the book is, uh, I am that. Right. Mm. So, uh, 
so he he said ha ah, somebody told me he said that there's a book called i am that but then he thought but but i am this he said <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my most touching uh, experience i had with him because i had only 10 15 minutes with him and the most touching thing was suddenly he turned it around and he, he put it upside down and he said uh, uh, because the book says i am that mai wo hu and he said but mai to ye hu <laughs> i am this he said so uh, this is the only it must have been 10 or 15 minutes mm. but i can say that i was very profoundly influenced by this 10 15 minutes mm. because here i saw a person who was very transparent he, he used to smoke so he smoked i mean he didn't say oh, what will people think right Right. and he was completely direct and very kind like i was young then so he was like an old uncle talking to you mm-hmm. uh, you know um because of that i forgot all the questions i had uh, about him whether he was from the nath some but i had many questions in my when i saw him i was completely disarmed <laughs> he was wearing a sleeveless cotton vest and the dhoti and sitting there hmm. <laughs> so that's my only experience with mr sarvanath nice on that point of i am that i am this um in in your own experience and understanding would you say that um both are true you know and that yeah. and that we want to sort of have an integration of of both yeah i personally feel that uh, it's only when i discover i am this that then i know i'm that right I, and that's i presume But because most... when i say i am that it again separates like i and that right i think people understand what we mean by that in this context and you know, all those upanishadic sayings about you know tat tomasi and so on um here's a question from punita in mexico she wonders um the experience of being in the presence of a guru is so profound and overwhelming and transforming How does one come to terms of being physically distant and knowing that one will not be able to relive that moment for another whole year? Is there a way to establish an inner connection so there is no feeling of the distance and pain? I know this person now. Uh-huh. Oh, she's very emotional in many ways. I think there's no technique like that except that if you keep thinking about the teacher you might feel the presence in your mind beyond that there's no technique however it will take some time maybe 2 months 3 months after the physical presence has gone uh, for the mind to settle down mm. you know it's like you suddenly feel that you have taken away from the magnet which was giving you some energy and you're off so it's like painful of course i have also felt pain when i for some reason stayed away from the master for some time so it's quite natural but we have to come to terms with that mm. because it's not the physical presence that is very important it's the inner presence that is important so i have to say to this lady this punit that uh, she should learn to come to terms with it yeah otherwise it might become another dependency you know uh-huh. um I would add and and I presume you would concur that um it's very important to have some sort of spiritual practice that really uh, enables you to absorb that presence or be in that presence so that yeah. there's a kind of a self-sufficiency and re- yeah. you know regardless of whether or not you're in the master's physical presence I, it's Exactly. The, yeah. And in the ultimate sense it's like you become the master after some time. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have another two Yeah. I'm not talking about any physical union. I'm talking about oh, of course. Inner. Yeah. Okay, good. Um I'm just clearing through some of these questions that came in and I'll have more of my own. Um but um this is a fellow named Atul Roy from Varanasi. He's wondering uh in our day-to-day life, which in the modern world is full of lies and deceit, how do we keep our spiritual integrity intact? it's a hard work <laughs> it's hard there no shock uh especially you know i think living in a place like banaras if he has to say this you can imagine the situation yeah in the rest of the world 
So um, it is difficult, but we'll have to draw a line and say, I'm trying to improve myself. I will not fall into this. Uh, it's tough, but there is no shortcut to this. Mm. However, if you have a guide and if you have a practice which has been given to you, that is a great solace because with that you want, you can fend off because you can't expect everybody to be interested in the spiritual line in the journey, even in Banaras. Sure. Oh, because 50% of the sadhus you see there are bhang addicts. It's not really like sadhus. So it's not possible to do that. You can't expect everybody to behave like you do and walk on the path. So it, there is always a, a contradiction in these matters, but you you have to work hard. I don't think there's any other way out of this. When I asked that question, read his question, I was reminded of that image that's used often in India of the lotus growing out of the mud, you know. It's it's planted in the mud and yet it somehow manages to retain its beauty and purity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have to stay there, I mean, and come out, bloom. Uh, there's another beautiful example by Jalaluddin Rumi, the mm -hmm. Sufi mystic who wrote the Masnavi. He says the sugar cane grows in this mud, right. but it changes everything into sweet uh, sugar cane juice. Yeah. You know, so it, it's not easy, I agree, because we tend to do what others are doing around us. So we need to have a corner where we are able to isolate ourselves, at least till we expand and grow. There was a story of a saint that I read one time who was known for always seeing the positive in, in any situation, you know, picking out something positive in any situation. And some guy decided to test him and trick him. So he took him down a street where he knew that there was a dead dog lying in the gutter. And as they went past the dog, the man said, oh, look at that disgusting sight. It's rotting and maggots and all. And the saint took a glance and he said, yes, but did you notice the pearly white teeth, how they shone? <laughs> yeah, you're right. So you need to learn this, actually, yeah. how to live in the midst of all this. In Banaras, you can take refuge in Kashi Vishwanath. Things can go whatever they happen outside. You don't have, you can ignore the priests, but look at the shining in there, you know? Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, here's a final question from this initial batch. This is from a student in Delhi named Pramod. He says, I'm a student. I want to ask Sri M, what a person like me, who has other priorities and aspirations, can do to progress on the spiritual path? Well, he must stick to his priorities, mm -hmm. but he should keep the flame still burning in his heart so that at some point when he can kind of come out of it a bit, he can go back to this, you know, at, at the moment, he can only keep this flame of attention in his heart mm -hmm. uh, and say, okay, I am interested, but now I'm caught up with these matters. So let me, but he shouldn't allow the flame to be blown off. Yeah. And yeah, wouldn't you say that there isn't any reason why a student couldn't be meditating every oh. day, even though he's in college or something, no, no conflict? That's okay. It'll help him. He, pro he probably is worried because, you know, the setup in colleges these days, is there's drugs, there is, you know, mm. this whole... Yeah. So he must be wondering that people might think he's a misfit. <laughs> but uh, I have a solution for this. When you're with them, pretend to be like them. Don't be like them, but pretend to be like so that you don't come in for criticism. Mm. But deep down in your heart, you do what you want to do. Even well, I do this sometimes, now, at this stage. Sure. Ah, sometimes I get into company because I don't wear mm. robes. There are people who say, oh, come have a drink with us in the bar. Uh, uh, so what do you do, run away? <laughs> I don't sit there. <laughs> have but a then I feel, Yeah, I feel that, yeah. And I feel that slowly these guys would understand, what is this guy now? We, we thought a man who is spiritual is sitting in a cave and here he's sitting with us. There must be something. Mm. See? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Jesus was known for hanging out with, you know. Beautiful. I love so that So-called lowlifes. <laughs> I love that part of his life. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I think if you come to the essence of everything, you don't see this difference. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. I don't know if you've heard this story. There was a, a 
woman of uh, ill repute living close by Dakshineshwar. Uh, and uh, many rich people used to go there on Sundays and so on. But they wouldn't acknowledge in public. So one day when she was walking near Dakshineshwar temple, um, these uh, some of the people who frequent her place were there. But as soon as she walked, they turned away from her and looked at the other direction. So Ramakrishna ran out of the room and fell at her feet and said, Oh, mother, what kind of forms do you come in sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And then he came back, which was a great lesson to these guys who were sitting there. So we should be ready to we shouldn't get caught up in it, of course. Mm. We should be ready to descend to any level. Makes no difference. Mm. If we can protect ourselves. <laughs> nice. Um, okay. So here's a, we're switching to a different topic now. Um, there are quite a few examples in your book of cities. Um, okay. And as you know, Patanjali devoted one chapter of a four chapter book to cities um, yet most teachers dismiss them as a distraction or an obstacle um, here's a quote from your teacher Mahesh Warnath Babaji he said there are no miracles many laws of nature are still unknown to most of humanity when someone knows these laws uh, who knows these laws operates them and does something then those who don't um, who don't know think they are witnessing a miracle um, so, let's talk about cities a little bit. N not that a lot of people are, you know, finding themselves able to practice them, but there is a certain fascination with them because there's so many examples of them in the spiritual literature. And then, you know, people like Sai Baba and others were supposedly performing cities. And so, you know, people have an interest in it. Yeah, you're right. There is a complete uh, chapter on Yoga Sutras called Vibhuti Yoga, which is the yoga of the uh, powers. Vibhuti is power. Of. Now, um, as Babaji said to me, there are many laws which we don't know which operate. The danger in the Siddhis lies in this, that once you start doing it, I fully acknowledge that there are. I mean, you have to separate the, the conjurers and the sleight of hand experts from the realities. Right. Of, that's there, of course. So once you've done that and there is something genuine going on out there, the problem is that if you start uh, demonstrating it, people, you know, it's a consumer culture. So people would be interested more in the cities in these things than the deeper aspects of spiritual life. So masters, teachers usually control, they don't do it as far as possible. But there may be less spectacular Siddhis, like, but more effective. Like if a person is suddenly in a spiritual spot where he can't rise above, the master can quietly uh, help him to come up. Now that kind of Siddhi is more important than producing a few trinkets, which even PC Sarkar can do on stage at least. So I don't give much importance to that, but I do give importance that a person can be influenced and transformed, which is also a Siddhi. I think that's the most important Siddhi. When you say, um, the philosopher's stone, or when you want to, when the Sufis said somebody has the philosopher's stone, is trying to change copper into gold. It's not a physical phenomenon. Nobody can do that. But to get material, which means a disciple whose mind is like copper at the moment, and to change and transform it into gold. Now that is a very powerful siddhi. It's not easy. You can produce a rings and Rudraksha, but so I think they are important. They're important from the point of view of spiritual growth. The moment they become obstacles to it, I think we should discard it. Hmm. Get out of it. One interesting thing about the principle of cities is that if someone can perform them, 
let's say let's say someone could levitate and people could really see him levitate and prove that it was happening um, it says some very interesting things about uh, what consciousness is and what the relation of consciousness is to the laws of nature such as gravity and it would it would kind of force physicists I think to uh, re-examine it. There's this debate in the, in the Western science whether consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain functioning, just a chemical process that the brain has, somehow creates, or whether consciousness is fundamental and gives rise to the brain and everything else. And if a person could actually perform a SIDHI in a verifiable way, I think it would it, it would really settle either settle that question or really bring it into focus as something to con seriously consider. Um. I think that the average scientist is too closed, even if he sees something like a Siddhi performed to accept it. Let's mm -hmm. be clear about this. Uh, also, many uh, of the clemens to superhuman powers have been tested by uh, the Society for Psychical Research and so on. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most of the results that have come out have not uh, have been in support of scientists who think that it is not possible. Mm. Mm. And in fact, there's a beautiful book. It's not beautiful, but it's a nice and critical book by Martin Gardner. You know Martin Gardner, who was names familiar. Uh, uh, was a mathematician, mm. uh, and uh, uh, I forget what he was doing, but. He has written a book called Science, Good, Bad and Bogus. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. Mm. I mean, in the sense that he's not trying to refute anything. He's saying that you have to be careful with these experiments because when the uh, scientists, especially when scientists say this is correct, because uh, when a scientist in a lab thinks that uh, uh, the, the test tube that is labeled A and the test tube that is labeled B, and if you're pouring something from B into A, you're actually doing it. This is what the scientist thinks. But these, there are people who pretend to pour A into B, but are actually pouring C into A. Mm. The scientist cannot handle this. It's not possible for him to think that way because they're accustomed to sincere, truthful thinking. They may be biased. That's a different matter. So I think the first kind of Siddhi may not be this physical phenomenon, but rather some way to change their minds so that they are able to examine the physical phenomenon without prejudice. Mm. Yeah. I'm trying this in some way, you know. <laughs> I meet scientists and I sit with them and talk to them. It's only when that mindset is changed that you can actually do something and say, now look at this and examine this. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. any kind of experimentation would have to be done in a rigorous way and not, not you know, totally some, not some kind of trickery going on. Yeah, because because then you fail if you disprove. Yeah, and you, you hurt the whole endeavor because it's easy to dismiss it all as, as fraudulent. Um, there's a, a fellow whom I'll be interviewing in September named Dean Radin, who's with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and he's done a lot of serious research actually um, on sort of the inf mind, not mind over matter, but the influence that uh, attention and mind and so on can have on various physical phenomena. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll just, that's just an aside. When, when, when are you going to do that? Uh, sometime in September. Irene okay. could look it up. Um, okay. So, all right, let's, I don't know if we want to belabor this point. If you want to move on, we can, but here's a couple of um, just examples of particular cities and, and some explanation in your book as to how they might work. One is, for instance, the invisibility city. I think your, your teacher might have explained this in, mm -hmm. to you. He said, a powerful mind tuned to the stillness of the Supreme Self, the core of our consciousness, can control the light rays, absorb them, and not let them reflect. Right. Um, so that's an example of uh, a kind of a, an influence of mind over a physical phenomenon which is ordinarily not thought to be able to be influenced and if you could right. if someone could actually demonstrate that it would really blow some minds true uh, I uh, I think we should try something out like that 
<laughs> because I think it's possible. Yeah. From my understanding, it's possible to do that. Uh, at some point, I would like to do this for the scientists. <laughs> Can you do it? I think so. Why not? Have you ever tried? Well, I've tried in private, but not in public because of this danger. You know, right. and there'll be people always seeking only this. Right, they would become a, a circus show kind of thing. Big, big. Yeah. All I have to do is distribute vibhuti and finished. You'll have lines of people coming. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I did do it once or twice. There's something called Soul Jones. I don't know if you... Oh yeah, it's, a, it's like a, a, a mm, conference mm, or something. Mm, yeah, mm. I've heard of it. So I did do something for Soul Jones just yeah. to demonstrate and I found that most people were responding to that and there it was growing. I said, look, this was just something to do with a particular uh, thing I was talking to him. This is not my main profession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I wish you could see that sometime on YouTube. Well, I'll check it out. Hmm. I think that, you know, what you would really want or what, what would be more ideal is if there were quite a few people who could do such things, yeah. because otherwise it's easy to say, well, this guy's a good magician or there's, exactly. or, or exactly. there's something really special about him and yes. we're not like him. But yes. if a bunch of people could do it, then it would kind of make people realize that it was a, in an innate human capacity. These, these things have to be worked out at some point, certainly. Yeah. I personally believe that it is required, but not in the way of it shouldn't have any mumbo jumbo about it. It should be clean and clear. Yeah. Uh, like an experiment. Okay, a question just came in uh, from a Sheshu from Munich, but I think we've pretty much covered this. He was asking about how you were able to see your past lives, but you kind of explained it already. So, mm -hmm. Sheshu, you'll, you'll hear that earlier in the interview. Um, okay. So, enough about cities. There's a few more examples we could talk about, but I think we've covered it. Um, some interesting points from your book. Uh, here, well, this is actually sort of an example of a city. There, you went to see um, Nityananda of Ganeshpuri. Yes. And I presume that was the same Nityananda who was Muktananda's guru. Yes. And um, you had this experience where he slapped you so hard that it knocked yeah. you over and, and made no, you made you cry. You're, you're just a young boy. Elaborate on that story. Well, uh, I think it's quite elaborate, but I was a, about uh, eight years old, eight or eight and a half years mm -hmm. old. And I had an uncle who was quite different from the rest of the people in the family because he was a bachelor, which is impossible in our setup almost. And uh, he was interested in, first time I heard the word Kundalini from him. He was my father's cousin, elder cousin, oldest. He was a headmaster, retired headmaster of a school and he was a teacher. So one day he came to me and, uh, oh, his favorite reading was Earl Stanley Gardner and Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> apart from his interest in yoga. Mm -hmm. So he came to me one day and said, I want to take you somewhere. Um, but don't tell your parents where you're going, because you may not be allowed. But because you're coming with me, there won't be a problem. I'll say that I'm taking you to a native place, which is about 40 kilometers away, to uh, train you in martial arts. He was also an expert in jujitsu and things like that. So he took me. I remember that two, three days we traveled by bus and everything. And when I was very tired, we reached a remote place, Ganeshpuri. In those days it was really remote. I had to take two buses from Bombay. Then oh, I remember that we entered, I actually wanted to eat a meal and go to sleep, but he said, let's go, let's go. So we went, there was an entrance which said Kailash. Mm. And they said, you can't see him now, come back after at four o'clock. I was relieved actually. So we went to a hotel and we had some food. I took some rest at four o'clock. There was a queue of people going, not a very long queue. So first my uncle went and then I followed behind. But as soon as I entered, I looked at him and I was really frightened. I was shocked because this man looked huge and he was dark. 
and he looked completely crazy because he was not talking to anybody in particular, just sitting there on a chair, armchair, and wearing just a small piece of cloth. He, and he was talking to himself and doing this. And so I thought, where have I landed now? Why has this man brought... When I say saint, you think of something else. So we passed, and when my uncle passed, he said, okay, go, something like that. I don't know the exact word, he said something. So he went up. Then I came. When I went in, not in, in front of him, he suddenly leaned forward on his uh, chair and gave me a tight slap. I mean, it was, it was so strong. The whole body shivered and I fell down. And I started weeping loudly, you know, actually yelling. So I had to be taken away. So we went off. I, next day, my uncle wanted to go again. I said, I am not coming. <laughs> Out. So then we went back to our native place and uh, spent some time there with him because he wanted to prove that I had come there. And then we came back home. This was forgotten after a while. And I had kind of resolved at that age that next time if my uncle wants me to go, so I'm not going. <laughs> so I had completely forgotten this. Years later, when I was with Maheshwarnath Babaji, he told me that you have to practice this particular breathing exercise to clear your Ida Nadi, which is the left uh, channel. So I did it for six, seven days and then he tested me out and he said, okay, you're on, it's okay. So like an intelligent young man, I had a question. I said, what about the Pingala? You said, Ida, Pingala? He said, many years ago, Nityananda cleared your Pingala with one slap. So there are two things here. One is that somebody could do that at a certain age. And the other is that this man, to whom I had not said anything about this incident, in fact, I myself had almost forgotten, could connect and say, this is what happened to you. Mm. So I think this is a great demonstration of extraordinary capacities that people have. Yeah. Maybe if you had gone back the next day, he would have slapped your other cheek and then the, the ida would have been cleared too. Quite possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or maybe he kept it reserved for this to happen. Yeah. You never know with this. <laughs> it's quite possible. And I have some good friends who have known me for many years who come back to me and say that, you know, something happened which we cannot explain uh, in relationship to you. I kind of poo-poo it so that they don't get attached too much importance to it mm. and keep walking. Yeah. The journey has to continue. <laughs> Don't get stuck there. Mm. Also, just on that point, um, doesn't the guru sort of function in a way as a kind of a, a, a conduit and things may happen as a result of him or association with him, which he himself isn't even conscious of or doesn't actually consciously intend, but which happen. The divine sort of does something by virtue of his ability to embody the divine. Possible. Yeah. It is very much possible. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with this. Yeah. The reason I thought of that, there was, Marshi told a story one time of how people would experience these great changes in their lives when they prayed to his guru, Marshi's guru. And he, he asked him about it one time. He said, how does this happen? Are you even aware of it? And he just said, it's the department of the absolute and he takes care of it. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> It's also a good way to slip out of this problem of people saying, oh, you're doing this. So, so say it's all part of the whole thing, you know, you're free. Right, right. <laughs> um, here's a question that came in from uh, Vidya in Texas asking, you mentioned in your second book that an enlightened personality that you met in one of your previous births predicted your mistake in your birth as Madhu and that you will be, be re, reborn as Sri M. In our previous interview, we talked about that mistake, and in your first book, you talked about it. Um, question, are all of our actions, our responses to circumstances, including our mistakes, already predestined? 
obviously if this guy predicted it that you were going to do it it seems like it's predestined if yes if we are trying to follow the spiritual path is that also predestined is there anything at all in our hands the problem is if you start thinking everything is predestined if you don't know about it mm -hmm. then you are likely to end up not doing anything at all and then you'll say that is also predestined mm. so it's a very fatalistic way of looking at your spiritual journey at least with your spiritual journey mm. uh, see when you are hungry for food you don't ask whether i'm predestined to eat or i'm not i eat <laughs> yeah, and you make efforts to eat if it's, if it's, yeah, yeah yeah so so i personally feel that it's my experience that while there is a blueprint, you are given freedom to experiment with it. Mm -hmm. You have a blueprint. What do you need? Otherwise, it is meaningless. The sadhana is meaningless. Not all life is meaningless. It can't be. I mean, it's not. There mm -hmm. are blueprints. You can't go beyond a certain limit. Yes. But within this blueprint, you have full freedom to work. Yeah. So it's not like, in my case, because I was being prepared for a particular work, at different points, different people came and said, do this, do that, you will become. But it doesn't apply to most people. We need to first look after our spiritual progress. And for that, we should let this predestination kind of idea rest for a while mm. and try to see how urgent it is to change. You know, otherwise it becomes an excuse for laziness. Yeah, uh, we need to we need to change. We need to take it urgently if we are serious. So therefore, I try to keep this out. Usually, when people are if everything is predestined, I say, look, if everything is predestined, why are you living on the? Why are you working? That's also pre I mean, it's very easy to say, oh, everything is predestined, including we are sitting here and talking to. You. Mm. It's not like that. There are a certain um, there are certain blueprints, but within that you can always change because the human mind has been given the capacity to do that. Otherwise, why would we have such a developed brain? Hmm. It's a waste. It's not a vestige organ. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Patanjali said, "Heyam dukkha managatam." You know, avert the danger which has not yet come, which implies that there could be some danger coming along, but you can take certain measures to Absolutely. to avert it, to ameliorate you should. it. You, yeah. you should. All great yogis have done that in their lives. Yeah. Like that story at the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam where the guy was cursed to be bitten by a snake in a week and he said, okay, well, if I'm going to be, bit yeah, if I'm going to be bitten by a snake, then I might as well focus on God for the next week, you know, and hopefully get no, liver. That, that is not destined. The snake biting was destined. That, that was. But so, then he chose to make good use of that week. And that's the whole Bhagavat. Right, right. That's how the story if came out. Parish, uh, Parikshit had not thought that way. We won't have the Bhagavat with us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he just sat around and cried all week, then he said, "Yeah, I'm going to die. I'm resting." <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. clears throat> um, okay. Um, this this question from Sheshu in Munich, which I kind of brushed off, it may have had, it may be significant and. Uh, be worth elaborating on a little bit. I think he was asking, um, you know, you were talking about this process where you go very deep within in a dark room and, you know, and he's wondering, you know, what is the beginning point where you could start to analyze one's past life? Is it a place? Like, do you particularly, do you tune in on an individual or something similar which triggered these mm -hmm. memories? And I think maybe even a more fundamental question is, is this something anybody should even try? Or is it, is it something that was appropriate for you at a more mature state of realization? Hmm. I would say that if you are on the spiritual path and if you are moving, when the stage comes, when your mind is very sensitive and kind of clear, then you get some hints. Uh -huh. You don't necessarily have to work on them and try to discover your past life. Well, I had... I did it for a purpose. There was a purpose behind it because most people say, oh, there's no past life. So I had to say yes. Mm. But it doesn't mean that all spiritual practitioners should deliberately attempt to find their past life. No. However, as you go along, it's quite possible that you might get hints about your past. Mm. You may choose to find out more about it or you may just let it go and move forward. Both options are open. 
And if you say if there is a beginner's technique, I think you should leave it alone. But if at all there is one, which is, it's, it's not deliberate, but as you go deeper and deeper into your consciousness, suddenly you come across some hints which seem to be not connected with anything in this life. Then you begin to think, what, what's going on? Or a place, as you asked, like a place or a person. Then it's a good idea to go to that place and sit for some time and reflect. And you'll see that some link is being established. There is no practical technique for it. That's what I'm trying to say. But would you perhaps agree that for many people, if not most, it might be a distraction or a distraction. Waste, waste of time or Very big distraction. better it things could you be could a, do with your, your time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It could be a very big distraction and then you go on to a tangent. Right. When you're looking for something else. Yeah. Yeah, how about this life? You know, stop worrying so <laughs> yeah, much. <laughs> a lot of problems here. <laughs> oh. yeah. And uh, people, scapegoats like me have gone through it. You don't have to go through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, here's a statement that I excerpted from your book that I, I liked very much. I think this was also your guru saying this. Appreciate everyone's point of view, for the truth is multidimensional. So what shall I elaborate? It's there, clear. Yeah, that's it, in a nutshell. It's clear because the moment you learn, you begin to say that I'm always right and the other guy is wrong, then there's something wrong out there. It can't mm -hmm. be, you know? Uh, because truth is a completely multidimensional. You can't say you can see it only from this angle. There may be other angles to see mm -hmm. it. If you don't think so, if one doesn't think so, then the truth ceases to be infinite. It becomes finite. Mm. And truth is not a conglomeration of finites. It's, it's infinite. It's not made by us. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Um, at one point in your book, you were talking about death. And uh, you quoted... You're, I don't remember whether this you writing this or your guru you're quoting. For the yogi who has overcome his desires, the subtle body fades away and disintegrates when the physical body dies, and the Atman is henceforth clothed in a pure vehicle called the causal body. For others, the subtle body carries all its vasanas or desires in seed form till it occupies a new body to indulge and enjoy the latent desires. So my question is, um, does the yogi still function in the causal body after death, and is that how we have ascended masters such as Ramana yeah. and Jesus and people like uh, appearing to people? True. So that functions functioning in their causal like, body. Yeah, yeah, in the Karana Sharira. Mm -hmm. But it's not like functioning in the physical body, it's quite different. Mm. Uh, because there is no central ego out there mm -hmm. which identifies itself with the physical body. So it's a totally, yeah, there is an ID, which means I am there, but I know that this is a temporary phase. Uh, and I'm doing something and I don't have the agency of doing it. Uh, it's, it's difficult to put it uh, in better ways. It's like there is the awareness that I exist, but not as this or that. And the work that is done is usually through inspiration more than words. Mm -hmm. When I say inspiration, I, I mean at a different level, not the, in the verb level. So there is an ID and that ID can be dissolved at any time. It's, it's left to the yogi to say, okay, done. But yogis maintain sometimes this little bit of a shadow of an ID so that because they feel pain at what's happening in the world and they want to do something about it and bring more people into where they have reached. Mm -hmm. there, there is no intention of keeping this little shadow out there. Uh, in the Buddhist uh, Vajrayana teachings, it could be the teachings of the Bodhisattva. Right. The Bodhisattva doesn't have an identity of his own in any case, but there is a shadow of an ID which is there to bring other people back. 
to where they stand. Uh, I, I don't want to use that word, compassion, because it's a big word. I would rather say kindness, the, you know. Yeah, and I think it's in Vedanta, there's that term, lesha vidya, you know, faint, faint remains of ignorance, which is said, even when you're in the body, to be necessary in order to function as a human being. Absolutely. But Absolutely. maybe there's some... Even Adi Shankara. Right. I think he had touched, but he had a, a kind of shadow of an ego, which is why he could do all the work that happened. Yeah. I mean, if there were no shadow of an ego whatsoever, would one even be able to eat or function? And no. Then you'd just no. be a corpse. I mean, you, Absolutely. Yeah. Not even a corpse. <laughs> Be sort of comatose or something. <laughs> huh. Huh. So, so these people who say they've lost all sense of a personal self, there must be some remnant of a personal self for them to function. Yeah, that is the shadow, which is the karana sharira, huh. the, the causal body. Mm. Mm. Okay. And please, we can't compare people who are functioning otherwise in the physical body with them. It's a completely different cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, so here you're contrasting s someone who is, let's say, enlightened but in a physical body with someone who has dropped the physical body but is still functioning by virtue of the causal body. Yeah. Right. There are, there are such beings. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, not only the great ones, you know, you, such as um, you know, Jesus or Ramana or whoever like that, but I mean some people perceive all kinds of Guardian angels or spirit guides or whatever they are um, Functioning in the world and attending to people in various ways. So it seems like there's a whole host of, of uh, Non-physical beings that are concerned with our welfare Yeah, it will be really at least for me mm -hmm. for myself It will be very stupid for me to think that we are having this interview, and there are only two. <laughs> <laughs> We've got you a understand? celestial peanut gallery. <laughs> we have a gallery here. <laughs> you, see it, you see it or not. Mm -hmm. ah, and it's possible that when well, it's over and I go to meditate or sleep in the night, I might be knocked and said, hey, where did you go wrong out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call, call Archer and tell him to edit that part out. <laughs> 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 well, if I may ask you a personal question, um, do you perceive these subtle beings yourself sometimes, either in the waking state or in the dream state or whatever? No, this is why I'm so careful. I don't know how I said this to you right now. Mm -hmm. Generally, I just keep quiet. Uh -huh. Because then people would think I'm some kind of a freak. You know, no, no. There's so many far out stories in your book okay. that if, if they if they can read that and yeah, they can, they can. yeah, then they can hear this. Yeah, actually, I don't see them all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if I feel not see but feel the presence, right? Then if I want, probably I can focus and see something. Can be visual as well. Yeah. Ah. but I can see the influence. I uh, even now I go to some places and there are some. If there are negative influences, they try to assault you. Right. I mean, they don't want positive things going on. Mm -hmm. you know? So, usually I finish them off. Yeah. That relates to that question that um, oh, it was uh, Atul Roy asked earlier about the world being full of lies and deceit. How do I keep, we keep our spiritual energy intact? I know there's that word in Sanskrit that's a Kavach, right? It's just like a, an armor. And um, there's there's the idea of sort of having a... Kavach. Kavach, Kavach. right. Having a sort of spiritual armor in which, you know, the sattva is strong enough that it just kind of protects one against such things. Actually, every human being has a Kavach. Mm -hmm. Every human being has a Kavach because of activities which are not conducive to your mental and physical health like drugs and alcohol and uh, too much uh, excess of anything it kind of develops uh, cracks here and there right the armor the coverage so the moment it develops cracks then it's easy for negative energies to come and influence you mm -hmm. may not it's not like possession or anything of that kind but to influence you 
So one of the reasons, this is why, when somebody sits down to meditate, for instance, a kind of kavacha is created around oneself. Right. So at that point, you're free. And one of the best kavachas is the constant realization and understanding that deep down in the essence of your consciousness, there is the divine. Mm -hmm. There is no more powerful kavacha than this. If that is always in mind, nothing can affect it. No negative influence, even if there is by chance a break, cannot enter. Yeah, and I think you're saying not just a the belief in that, but the actual experience of that in, in a in a real grounded way that, yeah. that you don't even have to think about it. It's, it's no. Just, yeah. no. People uh, may not experience it in, as if somebody is coming in or anything, but it's evident from the way their lives change. Right. But also, I, I meant in terms of that divine essence that you just referred ah, to, it's, okay. I, okay. I think what you're saying is one should really be established in that experientially and not just as a matter of faith. And, no. that, and then the coverage will be strong. Yes, of course. Right. It, uh, it may start with faith, of course. Mm -hmm. Because when I say faith, I, I think the definition of faith is to know that something is there even though you can't see it with your sense organs. Right. You know, which is a wider way of thinking than saying, oh, I would believe something like this only if I can see it with my sense organs. Yeah. Which are very limited. So, this is the beginning of faith. And when I say, when I have this understanding that deep down in the core of my consciousness there is a divine energy which is all goodness and well, partly ecstasy also, but more than that, a kind of all embracing uh, goodness and compassion in my heart. If it is in in the essence of my being, it must also be in the essence of your being. It can't be that I'm an isolated individual. <laughs> right. But yeah, whether somebody knows it or he doesn't know at the moment, it's still there. So, when we are firm on this understanding, nothing can happen. Till then, there is a danger. Yeah. Hmm. Good. Um, a question came in from a fellow named Raymond in Olympia, Washington. And I know Raymond. Um, and. This is a, a very relevant question. We talked about it a little bit in the first interview, and Raymond speaking from his own experience here, he said, awakened kundalini can be a catastrophic experience. Is there any way to turn off, turn the kundalini process off? It usually doesn't happen that way, but if it has happened, then there are ways and means to bring it down. And one of the ways is to live a completely worldly life for a short while. Worldly. Okay, in what, what would, in what respect? You mean no meditation or anything? Stop everything for a while. Mm -hmm. And come down and then from there gradually go up when you're ready for it. Yeah. I've even heard people say, well, eat meat, smoke cigars, you know, do tamasic stuff and it'll ground you. Do you yeah, tamasic stuff, but tamasic tamasic uh, stuff need not include meat eating. I mean, you, there are many people who are complete vegetarians who are very tamasic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, for it's a character more than the what you eat or drink. Mm -hmm. Like, the Hitler mm -hmm. himself was a vegetarian. That's true. Yeah. He's a complete vegetarian. I don't think he even eat eggs. But you see what happened. Sure. What a terrible... <laughs> person he was. So that I mean by worldly meaning, come back to your work, do things which attract you, mm, indulge a little bit in your life mm. till that vibration comes down. But please tell Raman that when it comes down, he will regret for it. He will think, oh my God, I need to go back there. Yeah. So when that thought occurs, then you slowly start working. It would help if you have somebody who can guide you mm. on this matter. Personally. When you say worldly, what, how about like physical exercise, massage, swimming, yeah, you know, ground, yeah. grounding Phys things like that, physical, walking in the physical, woods. Physical, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah walk in the woods, mm -hmm. uh, um, cycling, mm -hmm. strenuous exercise, good exercise, eat food which you like to eat and which you have discarded. Yeah. For various reasons. Something more rich. and Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, things like that, so that you are grounded. 
when you're grounded to this world, that becomes less automatically. There is no technique. There is no yogic technique to bring it down. Mm. Because yogic techniques are all to bring it bring up. Bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so, when that happens, then I have seen cases of people who can't bear it because it's too much. The body is not prepared for it. Body and mind. Then they, they let go of everything and they descend to such depths of you know, almost not even human, animal life. But when this goes, then they are really terrified because they want to go back there because it was so wonderful. Mm. So that's a good starting point after that. Would you say that, and I've heard from a number of people who have had this kind of experience like Raymond, to varying degrees, some of them pretty catastrophically that they can't even function. And in some cases, like there was this one guy who said, hey, you know, I just like to watch football and have a beer and, and now I'm having this huge kundalini thing and I, I, I didn't even know what it was and I can't work. And um, It seems to me that the more, I, the more one is um, able to purify the system and clear the nadis and, you know, make sure the pathways are not obstructed, the less um, unpleasant this will be and the more it will actually be a source of bliss. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. Mm. Yes. So, what has happened here is before the nadis were cleared up, some for some reason, a little bit of thing has been triggered off. And this guy doesn't know what to do with it. He can't come to terms with it, come to terms with it. So, well, the best thing would be to live with a teacher for some time. Mm. If possible. That would help. Possibly. Yeah. Who knows about these matters? Huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully, Raymond, that answered your question. If you have a follow-up question, feel free to send it in. But it, it is something that concerns me because I hear from people like, who are going through this and I would like to be able to help them, but I don't always know what to say. Or th There are a couple of people who, whom I've interviewed who kind of specialize in Kundalini situations, um, but I don't know. There needs to be more, more help available, I think. Yeah, because this is rare. Yeah. So people haven't worked on it much. Yeah, it's getting less rare. I, I think there's mm. some kind of awakening happening in the world where yeah. it's getting yeah. more common. <clears throat> um, there was a whole section in your book where you talked about astral projection. And we don't want this mm -hmm. to be like the reincarnation topic where oh, <laughs> people jump on it and want to start doing this yeah. necessarily. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but pr I think we could fairly say from what you, you wrote that for certain people at a certain stage, this may become appropriate. It did for you yes. at, at a certain stage and under proper guidance, you learned how right. to do it. Right. Um, and uh, you weren't just experimenting blindly. You had proper guidance. No, no. Yeah. And um, so you went to various places and dimensions. And some of this is very interesting and, and kind of far out. Um, may, you want to make a general comment on this before I refer to some specific things you wrote? Yeah, I, as you said, right, because under certain circumstances with uh, proper guidance, mm -hmm. it's possible for, I think, 70, 80% of human beings to come out. To do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. One thing that stops people from doing is they don't believe it can be done, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. You see, if everybody is bunging their astral bodies about it, <laughs> so it's a it's a safety catch that nature has built in, built in that you don't believe in it. Good, I always say that's nice. Yeah. Don't. But if you do, and if you ease out of your body, it's possible to move around. Um, in the beginning, you can't go very far, but as you practice slowly, it's like a child learning to stand up in this world. Mm -hmm. You fall, you get up, you, you know, it's a completely new dimension. So, and in the beginning, you can only see things in this dimension. You can't go anywhere outside this world. But as you train yourself, you might be able to go to what is beyond this earth and see things and feel things. One thing you should note is that you can see properly in the astral body, subtle body, you can hear, you can smell, uh, but you cannot touch. 
it's not possible so if one is thinking that i'll go in my astral body to a bank vault and bring all the money <laughs> this doesn't work right. because you can't catch anything right if even a glass of water your hand will just go through it it doesn't you can't do that but you can see that it's there mm. so the perfect test for this if it's really working or you're imagining is to go to a place note down everything keep it in your mind note it down the next day and go after a couple of days to the same place and check if it is the same mm-hmm. you see this is a very practical way of uh, seeing if it is really working yeah but then there is the fear that you won't be able to come back i always tell people there is no such fear mm-hmm. even if you want you cannot stay out for long you will have to come back <laughs> yeah, i think you mentioned that almost everybody astral travels in their dream or in their sleep you know yeah. um yeah. but i guess the question would be what why would this be a useful thing for a spiritual aspirant why would it be something that one would want to do intentionally no uh for me i i was taught to me to do intentionally for a particular purpose i don't do it every day mm-hmm. and since that i've not done actually except in some cases where i thought somebody might need help mm. not beyond that and for me it was taught for a particular purpose and also because for me to really feel that i am not this body uh, you know for these are the two reasons why i had to practice i don't think a spiritual aspirant need to project his subtle body out and so on and as i said earlier i was put through all these things so that when i come face to face with something like that i know what's going on mm-hmm. it's not required in fact i think it's a waste of time yeah personally so you would probably agree that it that it's something that one could just spend one could go through the whole spiritual path attain enlightenment never having Absolutely. you know shown it any interest ha- yeah no no but it might happen sometimes spontaneously right it can happen but you don't have to deliberately think that you have to deliberately go through this before you move forward there is nothing no such thing okay i'm making it very clear sure you. um okay just for this just to dip into something really esoteric for a minute just for fun uh, <laughs> when you were in that part of your book talking about the astral traveling you mentioned that you went to i believe it was um Mount Kailash and near Mount near Mount Kailash and you met your your master there who was conversing with some Tibetan yogi and when when you showed up he saw you and the two of you he left his body and astral traveled with you and you went to some cave up there and where you in where you encountered the remains of some extraterrestrial visitors mm-hmm. who came mm-hmm. to earth many thousands of years ago they came from a planet in a constellation many light years away they were deputed by still further advanced extraterrestrial beings to teach earthlings certain yogic and scientific secrets let me mm-hmm. read read just a little bit more from your book in a fairly big container were flat disks made of a white shiny material something like egyptian hieroglyphics were engraved on them Babaji explained that these were codes which when decoded with the help of special devices not yet perfected by mankind will reveal information about outer space realms and civilizations and the story of many previous visits by extraterrestrials they would also describe those rare instances when specially developed humans were taken to these far space realms and brought back after awakening special centers in their brains which distinguished them from ordinary human beings in many ways um so anyway i thought that was interesting and in the spirit of not being closed minded i i took it seriously i think you're a sincere man and um uh, i just you know feel like there's all kinds of mysteries and and interesting things that we as a as a species will are will yet discover yep i believe so because we're not yet ready for it right uh the greatest fear is that the present day science if it's becomes interested in it and if a couple of people like the chinese for it mm-hmm. can get their hands on this kind of technology turn it into it weapons can, it can become very dangerous in this world mm-hmm. so we might have to wait for some time yeah. before this is revealed but the caves which i have mentioned are not 
caves in any ethereal realm. They're uh, actual. They're actual, physical, right, right. Physical things, yeah. Physical things. And they are on the border of Nepal, actually, mm -hmm. on the way to Kailash. Um, I can't... I, I'm surprised that no one has found them after all this time. So many explorations have taken some place. People, some people have found. Some people have found part of the caves. They mm -hmm. may not have gone to the interior. I'm sure some explorers have found some places. Uh, but it takes a lot of trekking and things to get out there. Mm. Uh, the caves are kind of hewn out in the natural rock on the side and it has many entrances to get in. Mm -hmm. You need to pull yourself up like a mountain climber if you're physically going up there. To even get in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, so it's there. So I'm sure also that after some time, explorers may go and find these things out. Mm -hmm. But even if they find out, it will take quite some time to decipher what's been put in the disks, for instance. That's true. Because um, it's not a technology that we even have to be able to read such disks. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't think we have any such technology. Yeah. My feeling is that it could be some kind of a, a record, like a LP or something, yeah. or a disk, uh, which needs a proper technology to... To read it. Yeah. I, I was not told anything more than this, that it is so. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything more than that. Well, even with the pyramids in Egypt, you know, I mean, we've been exploring those for a long time now, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure that we don't really understand everything that, even how they're made, much less no. whatever knowledge they are supposed to contain. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Mm, the mummified bodies of the pharaohs were put there in imitation of extraterrestrials who were confined to the insides of pyramids. Hmm. In imitation of them? Yeah. So, but, uh, like what I told you in the case. I see. So you mean yeah. you, the, the Egyptians got the inspiration for mummification from extraterrestrials? Are yes. You yes. Okay. And we shouldn't use the word extraterrestrial because nowadays all kinds of people are talking right. about Little it. Little green men. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I would say, well, in India, we would say the Devas. Right. Or somebody who came from there. Mm. <laughs> in their flying vehicles or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there have been such interactions with humanity for thousands of years. I would even say that they have completely stopped now. There must be, there are some interactions still on, but they're much less than what happened before. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for those Listening to this interview, you, you should listen to Sri M's first interview and read his first book also. Um, in, in that book, he talked about a Naga being, a snake being, whom he met in a cave. It was quite a frightening experience, I guess, but very profound for you. Um, so, just one of those amazing things that, you know, are not generally known, but that could be experienced. Yeah. Yep. Um, jumping back to the question about Kundalini uh, and exercise and stuff, um, a, a fellow named Ganesh uh, Kumar from Chennai is asking, uh, is cycling and other extensive physical exercise detrimental for spiritual progress? This question is based on your comment that strenuous physical exercise reduces the rise of Kundalini. No. This, is, this was specifically meant to divert the attention of people who have had some premature awakenings. Right. Uh, physical exercise does not in any way act as an obstacle when you are trying to work on it. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it doesn't. In fact, it's good to have exercise. Sure. Uh, more than physical exercise, if you can strenuously practice asanas, mm -hmm. yoga asanas, because they affect the uh, your endocrine system more than ordinary exercise like cycling and so on. Yeah. So, there is no anti-awakening uh, to do with any kind of exercise. Okay, good. And uh, and yoga, of course, is very popular in the U.S. these days. And you know, a lot of people are doing all kinds of different yoga. Um, okay, good. Um, in fact, I would just add that 
not getting enough physical exercise can be detrimental to your spiritual progress. You know, I know people who just sit and meditate too much without enough physical exercise, and they don't look healthy, and they're not healthy. For, in fact, a friend of mine just died a couple of year, days ago who I think could have taken better care of his body. He, he was a long-term meditator. No. Uh, this is why the whole system of yoga is so systematized mm -hmm. with the yama niyamas and asanas and pranayama. You have to keep the body fit. A yogi is not an avaduta in the sense that he's not the one who has abandoned everything. A yogi is one who leads a healthy life, but not only physically healthy life, but the mind also becomes healthy. And a healthy mind has more clarity than an unhealthy mind. It's very, it's obvious. Yeah. So it's not the, you know, it's not opposite each other, right. not doing exercise. Yeah. In fact, you're right, you should do exercise, you should move, you must walk, you must go out it's, and then come back and meditate, not sit all the time. In, it's not possible, first of all. If one is doing that, then one is bringing about something very artificial. Mm. Sitting it's not up. natural. Yeah, yeah right. it's not natural. Yeah, there's a saying these days that sitting is the new smoking. In, in other words, people sit too much in front of their computers, they need to get up and move. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And um, here is a, here's an interesting question. This is um, getting a lot of questions from Indians. <laughs> this is from Rajan in Portland, Oregon. And uh, he's asking about the importance of prayer as part of one's spiritual practice. And maybe in, in commenting on this, you can sort of compare prayer with meditation and someone else earlier I didn't ask this question but he was asking about chanting the the Lalita Sahasranam as a as a spiritual practice so how would you uh, distinguish the the merits and importance of various things various types of practices including the ones I just mentioned mm -hmm. you know two kinds of prayer one is prayer for Worldly things. Uh, I want this, I want that. God give me this. That's one kind of prayer. But I think Rajan is asking about the spiritual kind of prayer, which is you pray that you want to move forward on your spiritual path. So bring me a proper guide. Help me to meditate. This is one kind of prayer. Prayer helps to make your mind steady. Mm -hmm. okay. Whether this prayer is being answered by somebody up there or somebody who's in here, it doesn't matter. But uh, it does bring about a certain effect, especially if you are on the spiritual path, because prayer also means that now you have reduced yourself to a helpless person who is asking for help. Mm. Now that gets rid of the ego for some time. In other words, we're saying, I'll do this, I'll do that, including meditation. So in the in the process of, in the in the, mood of prayer, you have surrendered. You say, I, I can do only this much. Please give me help. That opens the mind to receive. So prayer is indeed an important part of this. But more than prayer, like Lalita Sahasranama or Vishnu Sahasranama, which people chant, the thing is in these verses, there's one meaning, of course, but apart from the meaning, in the words and the sound it has been worked out in such a way that it affects certain subtle parts of your system, of your human system. So that again is conducive to um, going deep within spiritually. But the most, I think the simplest and the best thing is the chanting of Om. Now, one shouldn't think that Om belongs to a religion or a philosophy, you know, it's a sound. It's more than anything else, it's a sound. It's a primeval sound. So when you tune yourself to the chanting of Om, it helps you more than any other prayer can help you in the spiritual field. Just chant Om. Prayer, well, I want to reach the ultimate reality is already there in your heart. <clears throat> you don't have to register it every day. But when you chant Om, the whole mind, body, everything, including this little cells in your body, they get tuned to that sound. And that takes us into the inner realms faster than any other kind of prayer. 
Have you heard the notion that um, using Om, chanting Om, using it as a mantra, um, produces an influence which tends to turn you into a recluse and that it shouldn't be used by householders? No. Haven't heard that or you don't believe it? I have heard, but we don't believe it. Uh -huh. In, in, even in my tradition, we don't believe it. Everybody is given Om to chant. Om is a universal sound. It's not confined to just recluses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you haven't seen an effect that it makes people more reclusive or causes them to lose no, their belongings no. or something? No, no, no. I don't believe this. I don't. You see, the, some people may lose their belongings. It may not be because of Om. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something else. Yeah. Okay. Home is energy. It, it, the sense of energy, you can't lose. <laughs> okay, good. Well, you may lose what is not essential for you. It's right, good point, yeah. Um, some types of meditation, as you know, involve concentration, and some are effortless, and so on. And um, one of the principles of effortless meditation, it, it is argued, that the mind has a natural tendency to seek a field of greater happiness. Pure consciousness is a state of bliss, and if we can take the correct angle and just let go effortlessly, the mind will gravitate toward pure consciousness, and that concentration would actually impede that process. Uh, but others seem to be successful using some form of concentration. In your book you say, concentration is not tension. On the contrary, it is possible only when the mind is relaxed but attentive. So restful mm -hmm. alertness. So relaxed mm -hmm. but attentive implies, if it's concentration at all, it implies a very gentle kind of thing rather than any kind of force. Absolutely. I'm, I fully agree with this. You can't, when you say concentration, it's not using force. Right. It's, uh, from the yogic point of view, concentration comes when the mind is completely at rest. Mm -hmm. when it is, you, in fact, the word concentration is used to project to translate the word dharana, right. which is the word used in the Yoga Sutra. Now, dharana doesn't have the same connotation as saying concentrate. Because when you say concentrate, it's as if you're kind of doing something with great effort, forcefully. Yeah. Dharana means to be able to keep your mind moving in a particular stream without conditioning it in any way. They, it could be an object, but it could also be a sound, it could be an idea, effortlessly kind of, when the mind goes, that is dharana. Hmm. Then it automatically gets converted, changed into dhyana, which means long-term attention. And uh, culmination is samadhi, when one is not even aware of uh, a meditator out there, there is only the meditation. Mm -hmm. That is the effortless, complete effortlessness we are talking about. You know, but in the beginning, one needs to put in a little bit of effort to keep the mind steady going in one line and to allow it to go unimpeded along that path. So that's where it starts. But as you progress, it should more be a letting go than a grabbing. Yeah. So let's say you're sitting and meditating and you have, let's say you, you have a mantra and, and you find yourself thinking, oh, I wonder what I'll have for dinner. Now, I guess the, uh -huh. differ the difference here would be, well, let me work this out. Let's see, I'll cook some rice and then I'll make veg and you're going in, you're indulging in that as opposed to say, think about that later, back to the e mantra. E exactly. exactly. <laughs> so I was just going to tell you that sample of uh, music, for instance. Mm -hmm. Suppose I, I love music and I'm completely involved in either playing an instrument or in listening to beautiful music. It could be Indian, it could be like Western. I love Beethoven, for instance. Which kind? Beethoven. Oh, Beethoven, yeah, wonderful, yeah. So when you listen to these, this, what happens? is your mind is effortlessly absorbed in it. Mm -hmm. It's not thinking of anything else. So, the interest that you have also is part of the scheme. People usually sit down to meditate, but really they're not seriously interested. They think, okay, other things are there, you can add this also to mm. your life. But when it becomes so interesting and arresting, then what we call concentration becomes an effortless 
absorption. Mm. That's what we mean sometimes when we say it's not so much the grabbing as the letting go. <laughs> yeah. I guess you could say there's two ways of keeping a dog at your door. One is to chain it, and it might be pulling against the chain. Another <laughs> is to put its favorite food there, and then phew, dog will just be there. So, I mean, the, the mind Simple. loves inner bliss, and if it can be given an opportunity to move that way, it won't take a lot of strain or anything. Roughly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any, you know, any more comments on that whole topic? Or, or ha have we covered it? Yeah. By and large, I think, yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the word Abhadhuta a few minutes ago, and there's a chapter in your book about Abhadhuta Sadashiva Brahmendra. And um, if, maybe you should just explain a little bit what an Abhadhuta is first, perhaps. You know, an Abhadhuta is not a yogi who is practicing to get there. Mm -hmm. mm, there's a difference. Now, Avaduta is one who has got there, wherever, or whatever the connotation is. We got there and it leads a plentiful, clear life with no conditions attached to it. Mm. Like, he doesn't have to wear clothes because he doesn't see the need for it. Not because he's putting on a post. <laughs> he doesn't see the need for it. So an avaduta is one who has broken all social norms. Mm -hmm. You can see, you can't imitate an avaduta because you are not an avadut. Do and, do such people still exist in India and they don't get arrested? For, or I mean, you couldn't do that in the United States, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I won't put it past the United States that there are avadutas here. You can't say. They may be more careful because they don't want to get arrested or caught, but it's possible that there are many kinds of Abhadutas. They need not necessarily be the same picture of Sadashiva Brahmendra, for instance. But what I'm saying is, look at Sadashiva Brahmendra. He walked naked, he had no rules, regulations, nothing. But what he did was very creative. In fact, many people are not aware that Sadashiva Brahmendra is one of the major contributors uh, classical music to Carnatic music. Oh. Some of his lyrics are people don't associate with him. It is some of his lyrics are among the best in Carnatic music, hmm. classical uh, uh, South Indian classical music. One of them is Pibare Ramarasa. Oh, drink the blissful nectar of Rama. I, so even though he behaved like a madman at times. Hmm. The, he, there were other times when he was a very creative genius. Mm. So, and his most, one of his very important works which he wrote is called the Yoga Sudhakara, which is one of the earliest attempts to, to bring Vedanta and Yoga together. Because at some time these two break off. Mm. The Vedantin saying that there is no need of Yoga. Why are you standing on your head? The world is an illusion, the, you know that. And uh, Sadashiva Brahmendra is very important in this matter because he was a Vedanti. He was also a yogi. Hmm. So an avaduta does not necessarily mean somebody like a drug addict who is doing nothing. Avaduta is a spiritually evolved person who has broken all rules because he don't He's, he doesn't, he sees that the rules don't apply to him. Yeah. I remember in Yogananda's book, there was a story of a female Abhaduta and she was running around naked and people were really shocked, you know, and, and, you know, trying to criticize her and everything. And she said, well, what's the problem? I don't see any men here. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's that state where you don't see anybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... To imitate it is dangerous. Yeah. It's like Ravana Maharshi was one of a kind. Right. You go to Tirunamalai, you might find people wearing cow peas, you know, those small little things mm -hmm. and sitting down and pretending to be like that. Mm. You can't be Ravana Maharshi. <laughs> this is an important point and it also relates to what you just said about um, what Sada Shiva Brahmendra was trying to do, which was integrate yoga and Vedanta. Because even today, um, in not only India, I suppose, but the West, there are Vedantists 
who say you don't need practice, you don't, you're just enlightened, everything is Brahman, oh. just, just realize that and you're done, you know, and, and yet it's just a concept. No, I have to say this. Now, Sadashiva Brahmendra, since we started from that subject, I mm. want to mention this, wrote the Yoga Sudhakara, which is a commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, mm. where he integrates the, 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 the experiences of Vedanta with the practice of Yoga. You see, the Bhagavad Gita is supposed to be a essence of the Upanishads, self-proclaimed. It is Upanishads, it is Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, Brahma Vidyayam. So the Upanishad teaches Brahma Vidya, knowledge of the Supreme Being. But at the same time, the Gita also says Yoga Shastra, which means yoga is important to understand this fact. You can theoretically say, I am the Brahman, the whole world is an illusion, but you can't find out. You need to make your mind subtle enough to understand this. And that's where yoga comes in. Right. Uh, and even a great Vedantin, who is the founder of the Advaita philosophy, not founder, the foremost commentator on Advaita, mm -hmm. like Adi Shankaracharya, some of his works like Viveka Chudamani, for instance, the Crest Jewel of Wisdom. In the first chapters, he says that all that is fine, that this world is an illusion and where the witness is the only true reality and so on, but most people cannot touch it, can't find it. So he says, because the Nadis are very impure. Yeah. So he says, practice pranayam so that you get Nadi Suddhi cleaning of your nadis because you can grasp it only when the nadis are pure. You, you can theoretically say it and imagine that you are Brahman, but you can't be unless right. you know it. So yoga plays a very important part in preparing the person to understand the truths of the Upanishads. So it's a very ancient science. And um, Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm glad we touched on that point because it's something I run into quite a lot and I off, th that I don't feel that people always appreciate the distinction between knowledge and experience and they often mistake an understanding for the, the actual experience that that understanding represents. And it's like the difference between standing on the sidewalk reading a restaurant menu uh, and actually going in the restaurant and eating you know there's a big difference in yes. terms of the, your nourishment <laughs> so, absolutely yeah. so this this is where the nath sampradaya i'm not saying this because i belong to the nath sampradaya because maheshwar nath babaji was a nath mm -hmm. starting with adi nath machindra nath and the most famous being gorakh nath n-a-t-h uh, for those who don't know the word yeah uh, nath mm -hmm. so gorakh nath and so on the most important textbooks on yoga, which have survived today, in spite of the pure Vedantists saying this is not required, are the Nath Sampradaya textbooks, except the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is much ancient, very ancient, of course. And these are Goraknath's works, most of them. You know, Goraknath was one of those wandering, say, you can find him anywhere you go, you say, oh, Gorak came here. Uh, one is the Goraksha Shataka, the thousand verses on of Goraknath. The other is the Goraksha Samhita. Then there is the magnum office of Goraknath called the Siddha Siddhanta Paddhaji, which is used by yogis all over the world if they know about this yogic sciences as a reference book. It's big, little complicated. Then we have the Garanda Samhita, Yoga Samhita, and then, of course, the famous Hatha Yoga Pradipika of Swatma Rama. Swatma Rama was himself a Nath man from the Nath Sampradaya. So I think the Naths did a lot of work, contribution, in saving yoga from being totally eclipsed by theoretical knowledge. Mm. Because yoga is the practical aspect of purifying the mind and the body yeah. and bringing the energy in tune so that you can understand this idea that the Brahman is the reality. Yeah. I think in Western science we have this, a similar balance uh, between theory and experimentation. You know, for instance, when Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity, he predicted that um, 
that gravity bends light. And he said if someone could go to where there's an eclipse and uh, where the sunlight is blocked out and see that starlight is bent by the gravity of the sun, that will prove my theory. Of course, he also said when someone asked him whether if the theory was proven wrong, what would you have done? He said, I would have been sorry for the dear Lord, the theory is correct. <laughs> but um, in any case, there's this sort of, you, you form a theory and then you test it. So you have to have knowledge and experience. Yeah, you need to. And so yoga is where the practice comes in. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that all the, even the highest of Vedantins have been yogis in some way or yeah. the other. Good. You see? So. Yeah. Okay. Here's a question. I think this will be our final one. It's a nice practical question. Um, uh, it's uh, from Sat in Oregon, and it's related to being a householder in a spiritual life. Um, he asks, you were asked by Sri Babaji to live in the world, to experience the problems of ordinary householders firsthand before you guided them spiritually. I am interested in the wisdom you have to share about the life of a householder. What are the most important challenges for a householder and what are their <laughs> solutions? Choosing a what? <laughs> choosing a profession, choosing a mate, bringing up children, keeping healthy, dealing with aging. <laughs> that pretty much covers it. <laughs> uh. Who's this? Sat from Oregon. Sat. Now, Sat, uh, the most important element in leading a married life, if you are wanting to lead a married life, I never said that you have you can spiritually advance only if you live as a house. Never. Mm -hmm. There are people who aren't, so that's okay. Sure. But for me, it was a purpose because most people are like daily life, they're married, they have children, they have kids, they have work, they have jobs. So they ask, oh, can we spiritually progress? You are okay, you are away in the Himalayas. So I have, he I'm here, I have a family, I've lived with my children, I have. So mainly to, for me, it's a proof that this is possible. Yeah. With this, I'm not denying that you need periods of solitude. I'm not denying that, you need, but you don't have to be there always, you can come. <laughs> in fact, when you come back, you may perform better in this world. So, that's there. But to his question, what is the most important ingredient of being a spiritual person and also leading a householder's life? One thing is watch your ego. This is the most important thing. The moment you say, I'm always right, <laughs> you cannot lead a householder's life. You're, going to, you, you're you not going to get along with your wife very well. No, if it's to say not that. going to work. It's not, uh, plus, before you pitch in to live with somebody, make a proper research and figure out if the person at least is non-interfering in your spiritual practice, if not interested. Mm -hmm. This you have to do from the beginning. If you're not, if you're landed already somewhere, then you have to work it out in your own way. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most important thing is understanding. And I think if you practice, if you move in the spiritual path, your understanding becomes better rather than bad. Mm -hmm. So we understand that people can have different views because even truth is multidimensional. So ordinary things are, you know, like, and you're staying with somebody, you should have some understanding of what they want also. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't have an ego which says, oh, I've read the Veda, so I know she doesn't know. It doesn't work. You might have read the Vedas, but she may know something else right. better than you, right? So we need to understand this first. Then it's not such a difficult thing to lead a householder's life. Mm. And if you have to survive in this world, you have to work. But then again, as I said before about marriage, you have to think carefully before you choose what you want to do. Mm -hmm. If your intention in working is only to make a lot of money, then it's difficult to also be spiritual. You should say that I will try and do some work which does not affect me too much in my spiritual practice, not about the time more about my intentions. Like I can't be a smuggler and mm. or a drug uh, dealer and be a yogi. I mean, this is not possible. So I have to choose what I have to do. And once I have done that, I think personally, 
that if you give enough attention to what you're doing, to your work, your family life, without recoiling from it and reacting, then that gathers enough energy for you when you sit down to meditate. But having said that, please have your own private time to meditate. Let there be no compromise on that. If I'm saying from my own experience, so if, of course I had an advantage that before I got into the so-called worldly life, everything is worldly anyway. <laughs> Even the cave is in this world. Uh, I had a training and an experience which kind of made me understand things better. I have that, I had that advantage. So now everybody doesn't have that. So I'm saying you can learn from my experience. If, if there is a fire and you, you see somebody putting the finger into the fire and burning it, you don't have to yourself try it. You can see it from what other persons are doing. So look at me and try to figure out if there is a balanced way of life. Yeah, there are ups and downs, no denying this. There are, but then if you're on the spiritual path, you should have well learned how to balance. Yeah, right? and I, you know, I mean, we've never had kids or anything, so it's our life is fairly peaceful compared to what some people's lives may be, and I understand that a lot of people have challenges with so many things going on. Yeah. But, um, I mean, if there's time to watch a little TV or to gain some other kind of, do some other kind of recreation mm -hmm. in a busy life, there, there must be time to allocate for meditation. So Absolutely. 20 minutes, yeah. half an hour. Sure. Yeah. Why not? And I'm, I'm sure that there's no problem with anybody. The problem begins with, I'm meditating so I will not come out with you to shop. That is the problem. Right. Okay, I'm meditating now, so can we go out shopping? Just have later? to time it it's properly. Over. Yeah. <laughs> And to keep saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, it doesn't work. Say, this is how I think, this is how you think. You may be right, I may be wrong. It's okay. Let's try to find out. Yeah. Yeah. Sense of humility and compromise and so on. Very important. And if you, one doesn't have humility, how is one walking on the spiritual path? Hmm. I think in that sense, uh, you know, householder's life can be very conducive to spiritual development because you have a mirror and you are not Perfect. you're not able to just be sort of totally fixated in your own opinions Absolutely. and preferences you know you have true. to be flexible true and the wife is the best mirror yeah <laughs> yeah i've been on, on in monastic programs and at certain times in my life and people could become very obsessed you know and very idiosyncratic you know just totally hung up in some what, particular thing. I know what you mean. I've yeah. seen such people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have the balance. Okay, good. Well, I don't know if that's the best of all possible notes to end on, but it's a good one, I guess. And, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, Thank you. Is there any, th any kind of final comments or anything you'd like to make? Um, I just want to say that while the one we did before and what we did now with you, uh, while it's a wonderful uh, thing that we did, um, there's a lot of food for thought mm -hmm. and therefore the persons who listen to it need not take what we are saying as gospel truth, but can think about it. Mm -hmm. I think that we have, we have planted enough seeds to think about and figure out for themselves how it suits them because people are in different situations. Yeah. So that's important. The other is, I wish maybe this kind of uh, interview with Rick who's sitting in front of me will continue. Yeah, <laughs> good. Some other time. Would like maybe. that. Yeah. When I come back to the US next time. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it myself. Yeah, me too. There's a great deal of difference when someone is kind of aware of what one is asking. <laughs> so that... <laughs> Mm. Yeah, well, like you, I started in on this stuff when I was in my late teens, and have, I didn't live in the Himalayas or anything, but it's been the central focus of my life all this time. Yeah. I can see. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very well, much. Thank you, Sri M. And um, let me just make a couple of general concluding remarks. I've, I've been speaking with Sri M, as you know, and um, this uh, interview is part of an ongoing series. I've been doing it for about seven years now and will continue to do it. 
And <clears throat> if you'd like to check out other ones, go to batgap.com and um, you'll see a number of things there. Just explore the menus. You can sign up to be notified by email of new ones. Um, you can also do that on YouTube. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel that you're watching and YouTube will notify you of new ones. Or and there's also an audio podcast and a variety of other things. Just explore the menus and um, you'll see what's there. So thank you for listening or watching. And once more, thank you very much, Sriam. It's really been thank a you. delight you. talking to you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice tour in the United States and Thank lots you. of success. And Thank uh, you. we'll see you again someday. Thank you. All right. And thanks to those who've been listening or watching. See you next week. Namaste. Namaste.